Welcome back. We are in week seven of uh, inverse methods in heat transfer. In the last few videos, we saw um, these methods called maximum likelihood estimation as well as maximum a posteriori estimation. Both these are what are known as point estimates. I'll explain shortly what that means. In this video, we want to see a couple of things. We want to see uh, what Bayesian methods are. I had actually said I would talk about that in the last video, but I forgot to do that. So we will go from MLE to MAP to Bayesian in this video. And I also want to give you an example of how you can use a computational method to calculate these. So we are going to look at a very simple computational method within this video. We will turn it into a slightly more sophisticated computational method um, later on in this uh, week. Okay. So if you recall, just to make clear what we are doing, if you recall, we had done this simple example earlier of polynomial regression. So recall that we did this earlier in the course. Uh, an example of polynomial regression where we had these points that looked like a sinusoid and we were trying to fit higher and higher order polynomials and you might remember that when you did something like a cubic we got some reasonable fit uh, let's say this is a third order fit basically something like w3x cube plus w2x square plus w1x plus w0. So with these four unknowns, we were able to fit this. Now, if you think about this in a Bayesian or in a probabilistic sense, we have these four parameters. And uh, we try to find out the best parameters for this problem. So the best parameters, as we just saw in the last two videos, can be done in two ways. You simply find out the least square estimate. You do a MLE um, of this, which is a maximum likelihood estimate, and try to solve for the parameters. So this will give you some value of W1, W2, W3. So let's call this WMLE. Or you could do a map estimate which incorporates a prior. This, if you recall in the last video, is equivalent to adding a regularization term. Since this is equivalent to adding a regularization term, this is the same as the j least square plus there will be a term lambda by 2 w square and you try to minimize this and this will give you slightly different coefficients. Now, you might remember once again from our overfitting classes earlier in this uh, course, I think this was in week five or so, that when we had a higher order polynomial fit, let's say instead of third order, we had a ninth order polynomial fit, it went something like this. It fit these points really well. So the MLE estimate fit the points exactly, but it was a bad fit. Whereas the regularized fit actually went a little bit more smoothly through these points. Okay. So we can see that the MLE fit versus the map fit are different in general. But regardless of them being different, in both these cases, MLE and map are what are known as fixed estimates or point estimates. What I mean by point estimates is they give a single value for W0, W1, W2, W3, which is the best fit given the information. Now, I'll specify a little bit more what I mean by information as we go on. But we have two versions of this information. One of the information, which is the MLE information, in some sense, we will modify this as we go further, is just the data. 
Whereas the map information is data plus some prior idea about the parameters. Okay. So we saw that that's what is incorporated here. That was that is what was incorporated as you saw in the last video in the exponential minus uh, w square by sigma square and stuff like that. Okay. But either case, all you have is a single value. Whereas let's look at what I call a full Bayesian estimate or a distribution estimate. So in this graph, if we zoom in, the green line, so if we take the green line, the green line is actually the original fit. The blue circles are fit plus noise. This is the observed data. Now the red line which you see here is let's say the map or an MLE estimate. Now map or MLE estimates actually tell us the best fit. Okay, So they actually estimate W0, W1, W2, W3 etc. But then what is this band here? Okay, so this pinkish band that we see here. Um, so that band is a little bit more subtle. Okay, so this band that we see here is what I call the full Bayesian. The Bayesian distribution. So in this Bayesian distribution, you don't say only what the best fit is, but you give a complete full distribution for W. That is, instead of saying W0 is a value, you actually give the probability distribution function of W0. Similarly, instead of giving just a value, which would be MLE or MAP, I'm going to call this the distribution, give the PDF of W1. Now, once you do that, you actually, instead of having just one value, you have a range of values. So let's say this range of values is something like the mean value, which could be the MAP value, let us say, mu plus minus sigma. Now, another way of recovering this, which we will see, and this is sort of the cheating that we are going to do, will be or plus minus two sigma. We are going to get mu map. We will get sigma of the maximum a post posteriori and just draw this range as saying, well, actually the parameters are not just the inverse parameters that we discovered, but they actually lie within a range. But please remember this, in MLE or MAP, you are giving just one value, whereas in Bayesian, you are actually giving the full distribution or in the full distribution estimate, you are giving the full distribution. Okay. So now the question is, why not do that? Just like we did MLE and MAP theoretically, why not do that? The problem, of course, is when we write the Bayesian, PW given instead of putting x comma y let me just put x let x indicate the whole data w indicates the parameters this is as we saw last time probability of x given w probability of w now for map since we were only calculating the maximum only this part was needed okay only the numerator was needed but when you want the full distribution, suppose you want this whole value, you need the denominator also, which is sigma p of x w i p w i over all possible values of w. Now this, in the case of continuous w, is actually an integral. Okay, why you have to find out every single possible value of w, find out the corresponding term here and then integrate over that. 
This, as you can imagine, is horrendously expensive. So what really happens in terms of Bayesian is this is very expensive. Now we are going to find out some cheap tricks uh, or, or uh, simpler tricks in order to estimate this Bayesian because it's a useful thing. Um, and we will talk about that in this video as well as in the subsequent videos. Okay, so let's summarize what we are trying to do. The overall problem is like this. We want to estimate the parameters that generate the observed data. This is what we have been doing. I have been using pretty much always this lab problem, but you can think of the other problems we discussed. You can think of a fin. You made certain thermocouple measurements. There is some unknown heat transfer Q and you have made some temperature measurements Ti. You want to find out what was this Q or sir, perhaps Q is given and you want to estimate what is the uh, thermal conductivity of this material. Now you can give point estimates for these. That is, you can say, well, given this, the mean estimate amongst all the possible estimates is the maximum likelihood. So this is equivalent to, as is mentioned here, the least squared. If you assume a Gaussian distribution of noise. Okay. For Gaussian noise, you can see that uh, MLE estimate is the same as the least squares estimate. Now, maximum A per exterior is again uh, regularized least squares for Gaussian noise plus Gaussian pairs. Okay. That is, each thermocouple has some noise which is Gaussian and the parameters are themselves distributed according to a Gaussian and we have some prior and that's what gives you regularized least square. Okay. Of course, as I just mentioned, neither of them give you the full possible distribution of the parameters. For a full distribution, you have to use the Bayesian. And as I mentioned here, this portion is an integral over entire W or entire Y in, in this case. Um, but if you, in this case, I put why I should have actually put W, please correct that. Okay, so you need to, well, this is accurate. So you actually have to integrate over the entire W set. And once you do that, um, this is very, very expensive. Okay. So the compromise is to calculate the point estimate of the mean, which would come out to, as I'll discuss later, either the map or the MLE, depending on how you calculate it. And then you also calculate the variance. This assumes that the distribution of the parameters is a Gaussian. So you can see that we have made three Gaussian assumptions. We have made three Gaussian assumptions in that we assumed that the data that we collected was some original data plus Gaussian noise. Then we assumed that the parameters prior assumption about the prior parameters is Gaussian distributed, then we are assuming that the posterior distribution is also a Gaussian. Now, all these things happen to be reasonable assumptions in, in practice, but they need not always be true. Okay. Uh, in general, these calculations are theoretically difficult to make. Um, th that is because you can show that when, when I do a full Bayesian, even for linear regression, it's very, very messy. Okay, So I am skipping it. The earlier plan was to include it within this course. But it becomes too involved and uh, frankly, we don't need to do it as I'll show you. Computationally, we can get there a little bit faster, which is why we use, like everything else, we use computational methods. I'm going to call these Bayesian methods, though there is a little bit of abuse of notation there. And these depend in general on what is known as the Monte Carlo approach. Okay, now before we go to the computational approach, I want to give you further intuition about how exactly this Bayesian works in the case of, let's say again, our linear regression problem within a slab or something of that sort. So let's move on to that. So I'm going to show a nice series of visualizations. These are all from uh, like our overfitting slides. They are from uh, Dr. Christopher Bishop's excellent book on pattern recognition and machine learning. As I had mentioned earlier, the free PDF is available online from the official uh, book website. Okay, so what I am going to show you is a series of images that visualize what really happens from different viewpoints when we actually try to do a 
Bayesian estimate. So we are trying to do a full Bayesian estimate of the parameters of a problem. So let us say we have our familiar slab or something of that sort and we have a linear regression problem. Let me show you the final picture and then we'll come back to the original picture again. Okay, so let's say this is the final picture. This is the final data. The final data is this set that you see here. There is a whole bunch of uh, x's and correlated y's and you want to find out what line fits best, okay? Or you want to find out what is the kind of model that you wish to give for the underlying process that generated this data. So we are going to build, as we are doing this week, a probabilistic model. But initially, we have no data at all. All we know is some physics of the problem that tells us, so the only prior, so to speak, is something like our slab problem is y is linear in x. So we could say something like y is w0 plus w1x. Now the data that we are about to generate, it turns out uh, has some specific prior values out of which we are generating it. So I'll talk about that shortly. But initially we have none of that sort. Now, since we have nothing of that sort available, all we have got to do now is to create these random lines. Each line is possible. So every single line is actually a possible data set. Now, we are going to have another prior. The prior now says that, um, well, it is not quite every line is equally possible, but we can say that W0 is normally distributed with some sigma and W1 is also normally distributed with some sigma. So let's call, instead of calling this sigma, let's call it alpha. So mu and uh, so variance is let's say alpha square. So if you look at this picture approximately alpha square is four or something of that sort, I think that is how we generated this data. But it doesn't matter. What you see is not all values of W0 and W1 are equally possible. It is more likely that somewhere at the center, you can get values of W0 and W1 Whereas as you go further and further away, larger and larger values of W0 and W1 are less likely. Accordingly, you will see very few very high slopes, but a lot of medium slopes. Similarly, you will see very few lines with very strongly negative offsets, but you will see lots of lines which are reasonably correlated. They might go be going up or they might be coming down, but you will see intermediate lines. That's what this kind of prior means. Now, as you see, there is no likelihood. Remember, likelihood means probability of data given the parameter. But currently, we have no data at all. Okay, so the data will come in the next slide. As of now, there is no data. So this means no likelihood. Now, before we proceed further, notice these two pictures. These two are different pictures. Uh, this you can notice says prior as well as posterior. I'll explain why it says that shortly. As of now, let's call this the prior. And what you see here is an image which is in the space of parameter space. Okay, So remember, we had discussed this when we came to gradient descent. W0 and W1, how do they relate? Okay, And this is a visualization of the probability density function of W0 and W1. Okay, At each point, um, these points are very highly probable. These points have low probability. That's what you are seeing in within contours. Whereas this is physical data space. Okay, so notice it's the same information. Each point actually corresponds to an entire line in the physical data space. So suppose I take this point here. This is W0 equal to 0, W1 equal to 0. So that will correspond to a line like this. So 
each point within uh, the prior space or the posterior space corresponds to an entire line in the data space. So let's move on and see what happens if we actually start giving some information which was measurement from the slabs. Currently, the only visualization here is from entirely from the physics of the problem. We will now start visualizing what happens when we add data points one by one. So what you see here is we just added one single data point. Okay. So now we have two pieces of information, so to speak. The physics of the problem, which tells us that the entire data is linear and this one single data point. Now, how was this data point generated? This data point was generated in the following way. We assumed W0 is minus 0 0.3 and W1 is 0 0.5. Okay, and we took the measurement at some x, some random x, let's say x equal to 0.9, and uh, we just generated w0 is w0 plus w1x plus some noise. Okay, so it won't be exactly minus 0.3 plus 0.1 into 0.5 into 0.9, which would be approximately 0.15. I also add some noise. To simulate the fact that if there is a thermocouple, it is going to actually have some measurement error. Now, this noise has a variance. This variance is 0.2. Okay, so that is what we generated. So now we are going to generate lots and lots of uh, lines which can fit this one single data point. Now, you'll say there are infinite lines. That is true. So there are infinite lines that can fit this point. But there is a constraint. They should fit this line so that the Gaussian noise should have variance 0 0.2 square. Okay, so 0 0.04. Now, what does that mean? It means that 95% of the lines should be within this point, which is say, let us say 0 0.45, y equal to 0.45 plus minus. To sigma okay so you should be somewhere between um, 0.5 and 0.85 at this point all the lines that go through this point should lie within that range at least 95 percent of the lines that i generate should go through that now what represents this this is what we call the likelihood What is likelihood? Likelihood says that all these points, now I select a W, how likely, what is the probability that this data set, remember I am going to call it capital X, it basically contains the pairs of Xi and Yi. In this case, there is only one X and one I, uh, one Y. How probable is this point? given some particular choice of w so what we do is if you see this entire domain you keep on going let's say i select minus 0 0.1 minus 0 0.1 okay i put that i put that in the gaussian remember the likelihood was actually a gaussian this was e to the power minus epsilon square by two sigma square divided by likelihood function Remember, this likelihood is actually not normalized okay. unless you do this, but we'll come to that. This becomes particularly powerful when we come to the uh, map estimate. So assume this. I'll show you a proper computation procedure for this shortly, but here is the original point. Okay, You see that cross there. So let's mark this in black in order to make it clearer. So this was the original data point. Okay, so this is non-noisy. W1, W0 is minus 0.3 and W1 is 0.5. You put that in here and then you generated this extra point. And now you are trying to figure out, given this extra point, what is the probability that the original data that generated it was somewhere here? Okay, now for each of these choices of W0 and W1, you actually calculate a probability. Okay, and that probability is what is marked here as a contour. Okay, obviously, this is a very, very, very expensive calculation. We are not going to do that in practice, but let's say you did do it. 
what will happen is the probability that you actually had the original parameter is fairly high. You will see that the probability peaks right at the center. It starts going lower later on and somewhere right at the center of this will where you will get MLE. Okay. But this is an entire line for the maximum likelihood estimate. That's because it's not just one parameter that will satisfy this well. There are a large number of parameters that will satisfy this well and they will all be equally probable. Now, is that it? Are we done? No. Here we have a prior. Okay. Now, where did this prior come from? More than a prior, this actually happens to be map. Okay. How does this map or how is this map calculated? So let me show you how this was calculated. Now, this gave us probability that this data point, this blue data point was created by any one of these W. But we have one more information. We have the prior information, this one. We know that you cannot select a data point from somewhere here because that has very low probability. Most probably the data came from here. And as you go further and further, these become lower and lower probabilities. So how was this generated? This was generated by a product of true probabilities. P of W given X is proportional to P of X given W, which is this, multiplied by P of W, okay, which is this. In other words, what we are saying is, Okay, if I had only looked at this data point, all I would have been able to say is that the parameter lies somewhere here. The most probable thing is the parameter lies somewhere here or that this is the probability distribution of the parameter. Whereas I have some information from before. Now, when you multiply these two, okay, so let's see if we multiply this with this, you will see that the probability at the edges becomes fairly low. Here, the probability was high, but when it is multiplied with this, the probability here decreases. Similarly, the probability at this portion becomes low. It was already low here, so it becomes even more low. You will see that these portions become lesser and lesser possible because all these multiply low probabilities. Similarly, these portions get a lower probability because even though this probability is low, this probability here is high. But as a combination, we get this result. This, after multiplication with prior, now becomes the posterior. So now our map region is the small. What do I mean by that? That if I had looked only at this data point, I would have been able to give a lot of lines which can go through it. But this data point combined with the fact that W0 and W1 have to be low values, give us a region of probability space that is a little bit more restricted. So what you now notice is the region of map is lower than the region of the MLE, which of course is the region of just the physics of the problem. Just the physics of the problem without data. Just the physics of the problem says some line. When I gave you some extra data, that's just like giving a boundary condition or something of that sort, you immediately said, okay, I have a large number of parameters for W0, W1, but they are still smaller than uh, a, a full infinity. Okay, um, Then you come to map and say, okay, I am in an even smaller region of parameter space. Okay, So now we go further. As you can imagine, now I can add one more data point. Okay? So I seem to have repeated this. So let's say I add one more data point here. Now what happens? Now this that I am drawing here is probability of x2 given w. So likelihood of only 
x2 okay i am not including the first point as well as the second point so now i included the second point and now i draw the likelihood of that and you get another likelihood estimate so this would be the mle um my maximum likelihood estimate for just x2 now why did i do just x2 that is because we want probability of x1 as well as x2 given w which is probability of x1 given w multiplied by probability of x2 given w assuming we have independent x1 and x2 remember we made that assumption that all uh, measurements are actually independent of each other so we will make that assumption we will make the assumption that x1 and x2 are actually independent okay now you might notice that this has become even smaller now what is this this one is probability of w given x1 multiplied by this now you might find this strange i mean what kind of logic is this so the logic is very simple probability of w given x1 and x2 is probability of we you know x1 comma x2 given w multiplied by probability given of w this is proportional to this now this on the other hand is probability of x1 given w multiplied by probability of x2 given w multiplied by probability of w this we just showed by independence okay this therefore is probability of x1 given w multiplied by probability of w multiplied by probability of x2 given w this is proportional to probability of w given x1 so probability of w given x1 and x2 is proportional to probability of w given x1 multiplied by probability of x2 given w another way to say it is that this is the prior or the sorry this is the likelihood of the second data point this is the product of this likelihood with this posterior okay so let's look at this again you multiply these two what happens we already knew from just one data point that my data lies somewhere here i already know this so notice what we are doing this is what is the basic trick in a bayesian estimate the trick in a bayesian estimate is you keep on incorporating what you already know so this was the posterior in step 1 but this acts as a prior for step 2 what does that mean whether something is a posterior or prior depends on what we are doing so for example before we started anything right at the beginning of the problem our prior was just a physics prior okay this before we even know this this is just the prior okay now i multiply by this prior okay i get a new posterior that's why the word is prior or posterior this incorporates both the physics of the problem as well as the information that i have now this is the likelihood this is the data now this data multiplied by what was the previous prior becomes the new posterior posterior means after i know something okay so just imagine this as a chain rule suppose uh, you have a deck of cards the first card you pick up is an ace of spades before you knew anything that card could be anything and the probability of ace of spades would be 1 over 52 now once i pick ace of spades i know something else now this ace of spades becomes the prior for the next thing next i pick another card let's say that is queen of hearts now that becomes the new prior so same thing so this was the posterior that is after i incorporated the data and multiplied with this i got a new posterior this is the information i am going with i already know that the probability that the parameters are here is high now my second data point says well this is the probability of the second data point okay i'll multiply it with this now 
Yeah, I'll multiply it with this. And once you see that, you will see that the regions where are that are high become even smaller. Okay, so now you are relegated to a much smaller space. Now you keep on adding data like this. Let's say this is finally the 20th data point. So there were 20 data points in this data set. What you have here is just the likelihood of the 20th data point. By the time you apply this to smaller and smaller regions, you can see that the parameter space is really, really small. This is the final Bayesian estimate for our parameter space. And you can see that the lines start converging. Okay, You can see very, very, very few lines are possible. 95% of the lines will converge to a very, very, very small space. So let's put all of it together. The prior for the previous step multiplies this, gives you the posterior. Prior multiplies this, gives you the posterior. And you repeat it 20 times. And you get the final Bayesian estimate. At each step, what you have is really a Bayesian estimate. At each step, you actually do have a Bayesian estimate, but you uh, sort of keep on accumulating this Bayesian step by step by step, and you get a final Bayesian estimate. As you can see, uh, this entire process can be computationally expensive. Okay, we are going to show a sort of naive version of this within this course. There are very sophisticated methods for this. I am going to show you a very, very naive version of how to do this uh, starting from the next video. I had something a little bit more sophisticated plan, but I think that will be overkill for a course. Like I said, this course is basically an undergraduate level course, just an introduction to inverse methods. And you can see that all, already that gets pretty complicated. So we will uh, 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 stop ourselves to a, a naive version of this. And I'll start with what is known as uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo in the or a pure Monte Carlo and Mont Markov chain Monte Carlo in the next video. So I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.